So hi everybody, welcome and thank you for joining us for Building from the Ground Up. It's a project that Tech Cabal is doing in partnership with the UK Nigeria Tech Hub um, and the UK government. And today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Ola Brown with us. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Excellent. So I'm going to lay kind of a little bit of uh, background on the event and then I'll talk through some rules and then we'll We'll get into this conversation. Uh, the entire thing should last about 90 minutes. Uh, we'll have 45 minutes of me asking you questions and then we'll take the questions from the audience as well. Overall, this event today, um, like I said, is in partnership with the UK Nigeria Tech Hub. Um, it's an initiative by the UK government's department for digital culture, media and sports to support the growth of the tech ecosystem in Nigeria. And the Tech Hub works to stimulate local digital economies to so support inclusive and sustainable economic growth and jobs uh, to build digital skills and forge partnerships between Nigerian tech sector and international businesses um, among the, um, and ultimately the goal is sort of to lead to more trade and investment between Nigeria and the UK. So we are really glad for their support and uh, we're glad to be here today. I'll speak um, for those in the audience who don't know Dr. Ola Brown. She's a British Nigerian medical doctor, healthcare entrepreneur, and she's the founder of Flying Doctors Healthcare Investment Group. She's also a director at Green Tree Investment Company, which invests um, across a range of industries, but particularly tech, um, early stage investments. Uh, the Flying Doctors Healthcare Group itself sort of invests and operates across the healthcare value chain um, in air ambulance services and logistics. Uh, consulting and healthcare technology, hospital and clinic construction, diagnostics and equipment, healthcare facility management, and pharmaceutical retail. They also did a lot of work um, over the course of 2020 in terms of testing in response to sort of the COVID-19 uh, challenge. Thank you very much and good to have you. Lovely to see you too and lovely to be speaking to you today. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the conversation. Yeah, uh, so are we. In terms of house rules, um, like I said, we'll be speaking for about 90 minutes. And so I'm going to start our conversation with Flying Doctors. And I'm going to ask you to talk us through sort of ideation of that product. You know, what is it? How is it that you came up with the idea that you needed to do this? And how did you come to actually, how did you move from, here's a thought in my head, something could be interesting, to the initial stages of execution. So just where did the idea come from and why? So the initial idea, I, I grew up sort of fantasizing about um, becoming a doctor from, you know, watching TV shows about doctors and um, my own sister actually suffered from sickle cell anemia. So um, we we're always in and out of hospital. So like the doctors were like my heroes. But as I went through medical school, um, I started to realize that, you know, it, sometimes uh, it, the system that a doctor operates in matters and um, it's not just um, limited, healthcare isn't just limited to treating the patient in front of you, um, like I was doing, but also treating, looking at the systems and seeing how, from sort of a bird's eye perspective, um, things could be made better. And, you know, nothing hit me harder than um, when my own younger sister actually died in Nigeria, due to the fact that she couldn't be um, transported from one area to another um, fast enough in a professional way. And it made me start thinking even more uh, about systems and about perhaps how I could contribute to them. So I started also thinking about what I liked to do, um, what interested, what areas of medicine interested me. I was already doing a lot of extra modules in emergency medicine and pre-hospital care. Um, I love flying. Um, um, and after medical school, one of the first things I did was um, start um, flying lessons because I really, really enjoyed flying helicopters. Um, so I thought if there was any way to combine this interest in healthcare systems um, with, um, you know, something that I knew was a, a need um, in Nigeria, then, you know, this, this would probably be an idea that I could focus on, something that um, I, I could work on, um, and something that perhaps I had a bit of the expertise to deliver. But I don't want to just tell a story of just, you know, passion and need, um, because that's not entirely true. And I think that it's really important. Um, when I saw the title of this podcast, 
I realized like it would be unfair to the audience if I didn't bring my authentic self here. So I find that there's a lot of, you know, evidence. Um, the person that writes about this the most is um, Jeffrey Pfeffer, um, who's a professor at Stanford. And he, he says that, you know, the, the thing about um, entrepreneurs relating their stories back is they tend to edit their stories a lot. So when you're hearing, you know, um, a famous entrepreneur talk, you're hearing like a very edited version of the truth. So I'm trying not to edit. I'm being very, very cautious of that. Um, and, you know, my salary, my NHS salary at the time was probably minus tax around £23,000, maybe that around that figure. And I knew that even if I could just do one air ambulance trip a year, yeah, just yeah. one, I would make more than that money, even if I was just to do one. So I thought, you know, um, compared to my salary, there was also a commercial opportunity in Nigeria. So it was a, definitely a combination of passion, um, need, interest. Um, but there was also, you know, I, I saw like a commercial opportunity to do better than I'm doing. And I don't want to edit that bit out because I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, there's a lot of advice going, you know, follow your passion. You know, it's what yeah. it's, it's <laughs> passion that matters. And, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that Dangote is that passionate about cements or salt. Um, <laughs> but, um, obviously, he saw a commercial opportunity. So I don't want to edit out the fact that there was a commercial opportunity there. I knew that there was a strong oil and gas industry. I knew that really I'd only have to do one business <laughs> to be earning more than my, uh, my, my, my salary. So it was, it was a comb- definitely a combination of factors. Okay. I mean, I think that's really interesting. Tell me about how you did that research in terms of, because one of the things that people always say is, you know what, how do you know the size of your addressable market is one of those questions that people have. How do you validate your assumptions because you're sitting in the uk you're making the assumption that if i can do just one flight you know when you got to nigeria was that true the expectation that you could um you know do the business with oil companies did you then how do you know regulation would allow you to do it you know so there's a bunch of validation around here's an idea but here are the realistic things needed to actually make it happen how did you go through that process so um, I, I, I was actually, I wasn't in England at the time. I'd taken a year out. And okay. in, during my year out, I was doing academic research um, okay. in Tokyo. And one of the things about living in Tokyo is like, if you want to speak English with people, like nobody in my hospital really spoke English. So I wanted to speak English with people. It was the expat community. So it was all the McKinsey consultants, all the Goldman Sachs, all the hedge fund managers. So. I moved from a group of friends that was just like science geeks and doctors, right? Because, um, you know, my only friends before that period were doctors, the people that were always talking about finance and always talking about business. So um, I started to speak to them. I mean, even my son, my, my group teacher, and, and I, I'm, in terms of like social class, it gave me an opportunity to interact with people that I would have never been able to interact with in England because of this language thing where I, the only group of English speaking people were, you know, all these high flying bankers. So even like my house group at church, um, which was like one of the only English speaking in, uh, churches in, in Tokyo, um, he was the vice president of a bank. So I started okay. speaking to, you know, my Sunday school teacher and all of the English uh, speaking people that I knew. Um, about this idea of, you know, starting an air ambulance in Nigeria and sort of, they gave me um, ideas, helped me build a model, helped me to uh, sort of understand what the risks were, advised me to, rather than um, completely quit my job, to defer my job so I'd still have a job to go back to if this didn't work out and sort of um, gave me some guidance, I guess, some mentoring. Um, So there's always a bit of luck in these stories. And the bit of luck for me was, you know, as a medical physician, really your business is like giving injections and, you know, reading pathophysiology and diagnosis. And your, my circle of friends, if I had not moved to Tokyo, would have been, I would have never gotten that quality of advice. Um, and I would have never, you know, been able to be in those circles where they were continually talking about finance, investment, the way deals work. Um, and I'd have never gotten that level of mentorship if I hadn't made that insane move um, to move to Tokyo. 
Um, so through that, I got some of the confidence that I needed um, and some of the advice that I needed and some of the market um, val validation that I needed, but not all. I didn't have all the answers. I would say that uh, it was a 20% chance. So I, I decided instead of going back um, to London after the um, end of my fellowship to move to Lagos and see if this idea was was going to work. And I started um, by speaking to the NC um, and the regulators. I started by speaking to some of the oil and gas companies, and I realized that um, there was a gap. Um, but it took about nine months before we got um, our first flight. But uh, the more I spoke to people and interviewed people when I got to Nigeria, um, the more I started to realize that, in fact, there was um, there was a gap in the market because and there was a market, more importantly, there was a market in the gap. Because I think a lot of a lot of times when we have, you know, business ideas, there's definitely yeah. a gap in the market that everybody can see. Uh, but sometimes there's no market in the gap. So I was trying to make sure that there was not only a gap in the market, but a market in the gap. And I think that that's easier to do with um, a business to business sort of market compared to a business to customer kind okay. of. How so? Um, well, with a, with a bus with, in a B2B business or a B2G business, you only really need a few clients. Yeah. So like, I, I know people in Nigeria that the only client is an MPC or the BASA. They don't need a <laughs> customer. Like, so yeah. in a B2B or B2B business, you, you really only need like two or three clients to pay your bills as long as, you know, they're, they're on retainership with you. Whereas with a B2C, ah, you can need hundreds before you can break even. Um, yeah. And I think as young people starting businesses, we look at our own perspectives, right? So my friends need hair. So let me start a hair business. Um, my yeah. friends need, um, you know, small chops. So let me start a small chops business because I know uh, my friends use fake eyelashes. So let me start a fake eyelash business. But we forget that our friends are broke. Yeah. <laughs> well, some friends. <laughs> In general, you know. Yeah. But yes, will not be able to buy in large volumes on a consistent basis. Um, whereas um, with B two B businesses, they are not broke. The money is not a problem. So you've cancelled that one out of the equation. It's now: do you add value? Do you deliver value? Is it meeting a need? Um, so sometimes with B two B businesses, B two C businesses, especially in countries like Nigeria with high levels of poverty, people want what you have. They just can't afford it or they can't yeah. afford what you're charging for it, or they can't afford what it costs to produce it. But at least with the B2B business, the affordability is out of the question now. It's just usually speaking, as long as it's not a wildly priced product, it's usually like, you know, what value is this delivering above and beyond what we or, um, regularly normally have? And, you know, how, um, how, what are the relationships within that organization um, that will need to um to develop it to the point um that there's a there's a sale yeah, so i think yeah. the key differences um between a b2b and a b2c business and um why in some respects i think that b2b might be easier but b2c obviously um in the long run that's what produces the unicorns right most of the time but then you have companies like self salesforce um that are b2b as well um, but most of the time you see big B2C, B2C um, businesses um, rather than B2B, which, well, maybe we don't even see them. Um, we don't see them as much. They're not as visible because they're marketing to other businesses. And that was the case with me. I could, I could market to um, a few businesses with very specific needs um, to get the business started. And then I could grow from there using the capital base that I got. Fantastic. Let's talk about getting started. So you validated your idea. You've um, identified that there's a market in the gap. And I quite like that. That's a really great uh, way to think about it. Um, so there's actual revenue to be made in solving this problem. Great. How did you pull together the funding for it? What were the first steps? You know, where does one even buy a plane from and uh, get this started? So I didn't. And that's kind of another thing with um, B2B businesses. The first company... Um, yeah. that um, showed an interest actually was my off-taker. So okay. I did it the other way around. Um, I marketed to a company who had a really, really, really acute need um, for the service. Um, and they had just had a few people die. 
um, and they really wanted to make sure that people um, could get from their very remote facilities to facilities in Lagos and Abuja, um, and also really needed um, needed the um, more regional. So it was a regional spread of a company. Um, so they really needed the more regional services um, as well. So I was I met I'm sure I can't say names. I met Captain Kide Dare when he was actually still working at the um, Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. Um, and we just met in passing. And um, when he was leaving, he passed me on to somebody who would sort of continue the engagement. But so I thought that that was relationship was done. But then a few months later, he called me and said, you know, I'm working for this guy now. And he's trying to sell his old aircraft, the old, really rugged, ugly aircraft that he has because he's just gotten a new one. But why don't you, you know, um, use it for air ambulance services in the meantime. So immediately I said, you know, please, can you be on my board? You obviously know more about this than I do. You were um, sort of director of operations um, at an oil company, one of the largest oil companies in Nigeria. And he was also director of operations at the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. So I took him in as an advisor. He became a mentor to me. Um, and, you know, he took me to see the owner of the aircraft. We started speaking about the pricing. So I knew the pricing. So when I went back to the company, I said, you know, this is the way that it's going to work. And I actually um, asked for slightly more than the cost of the aircraft from them. Um, and, they, um, and the agreement was made. So actually my customers almost entirely funded my business. My main need for funding was because of the type of customers that um, I was serving. So a lot of these big corporates, a lot of these big oil and gas companies, they do pay, but they pay 60 to 90 days. All right, the cash flow conversion becomes a... Yeah, mass. so this is a bit of funding that people don't necessarily talk about. Um, so if you've done, um, you know, a number of air ambulance trips around the world, you know, Lagos to China, Lagos here, Lagos there, you know, Gabon this, you, you know, you can do a lot. And, you know, very quickly, you can be owed millions of dollars. All right. So my biggest, you know, funding challenge was like, and sometimes you even have to put deposits down in the hospitals that they're going and they'll say, oh, we'll pay you later. Well, those deposits are like $100,000, right? So, so I, I, I got very early on in my business, I, I got into a few cash punch situations and one of them ended up with me sitting in front of a bank empty crying <laughs> Because literally, <laughs> I, I couldn't, I couldn't, we couldn't meet our obligations, not because we didn't have the funding coming in, but because yeah. we we're waiting for too, uh, too much money from clients. Um, so instead of giving me the amount that I asked for, he actually helped me restructure the entire business. So he sat down together and said, you know, you can't afford this. You need to write to all these people and say that. The number of days i said it's not possible they've already told me i've already signed there's no way he said okay some of these guys i know personally i'm going to make a few calls for you and explain your situation you might not have the relationship to do that but um i as you know in town can do that for you um so he 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 sat with me and and um, helped me to restructure um and then gave me a short-term facility um to be able to meet my obligations until the results of the restructuring came through but yeah, I cried in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had that experience, but uh, yeah, definitely dealt with the cash flow issue. So, so I think, um, I point think point when people talk about funding, I think this is a really important point. When people talk about funding, um, you know, they think that the major problem is, you know, startup funding. But for me, because of the way um, I structured things, I could get customer funded um, um, customer yeah. funding for my business. And I think that there's a lot of businesses that kind of neglect how you can run yeah. a customer funded business. Um, yeah. And yeah. there's a course at the University of London by, gosh, I've forgotten this professor's name, but the course is on Coursera. And it talks about, I think, the eight models of customer funded businesses that you can have. I didn't know this until like months after, but I've, I'm, um, it's a, a fantastic course. Um, so sometimes the hustle for funding takes away a lot of attention from business models that can pay up front. And I'm not, you know, my business was quite a big capital intensive business, but even somebody like the lady that makes my suits, for instance, I, I wear the same thing every day, but I like proper tailoring on what I wear every day. 
Um, okay. So that makes my suits. And she, she takes money up front from everybody that she makes suits for. And those suits are, you know, close to, close to six, I think, 60,000 Naira. So she takes, like, you know, from 20 people on the 1st of um, January. And she doesn't have to deliver the suits until six weeks down the line. So yeah. um, I don't think she will, at least, she, she has these quite large cash flows because she has quite a few clientele. She has a floor full of tailors and she gets international um, people ordering as well. So people from America, people from the UK ordering. So she has very good um, Forex flows, but she's never raised funding. Yeah. Um, and it's because she's figured out a way, even like on a small scale, to be able to do something really well that people want and be able to get um, her funding up front um, from a, a whole range of clients and then deliver later. So I think that that's an important um, business um, model and something that I, I think a lot of people tend to miss. I think that's, um, that's fantastic. Let me ask you, I'll ask you just one more funding question and then I do want to move away from it um, into more operational kind of conversations. But I think particularly depending on the size of your business, that's always an opportunity. And I think definitely more people need to think about sort of customer funded models. But when you're scaling, so in your business, have you ever had to raise any additional business to scale the business or have you entirely stayed customer funded? And does this, no. does this work depending on the size, you know, what the scope of your ambition for the business, for the company? Is this sustainable over the long term from your perspective? Um, no, so I, I subsequently um, had to raise debt funding, um, but I think it's easier to do once you have, you know, a balance sheet that says, you know, this is what has been coming in for three to four years, um, and this is what, um, you know, this is what my business has been like, this is how it has grown, um, and w w when you're doing that transaction with a bank that you have a long-term customer relationship with, so on my birthday... <laughs> There were like 30 people from my bank that attended. So like, it's not like, so when you have a good cash flow relationship and then yeah. you have a good relationship with your bank and like if, if you've been changing banks and um, you, you haven't um, sort of stopped in one place, but these people have known me since I started. They've known me since there was like $200 in my account or like less. They've known me when I couldn't yeah. afford to even fly to Abuja, I had to take the bus the night bus for that matter, because it was more expensive during the day. Like, oh, wow. so these are people that have <laughs> me through my entire um, entrepreneurial journey. So um, I think it's been a bit easier for me to, oh, it, somebody has put the name of the person there already. Gosh, you guys are quick in this audience. It's John Mullins, oh, the name oh, of the um, a London, um, London business school that does a course on customer funding, <laughs> customer funded business models. <laughs> people are quick to buy with Google. Um, so yeah, um, so, sorry, yeah. going back to, so um, yeah, I did have to raise, but by the, by the time I raised, obviously like I, I had the whole, entire institution behind me because I'd had good relationships and I'd also invested in those relationships as well. So um, for instance, um, you know, when, you know, uh, the AGM or the GM is having an event, they've had a baby, they've got, got a burial, you know, there I was like hustling my way into Anambra, you know, like <laughs> stopping in, uh, taking a flight to Awuri and driving like through God knows where to find this village. So I had built, I, I had built, the, built those relationships. And when I started equity financing as well, I realized that a lot of the businesses that um, I, as an investor, had invested in had been people that I had relationships I knew and people that, you know, I like their business, I like the team, but I also knew them from when they first started or when they pitched. Like, um, I'll give an example of MDAS. I met the team from MDAS, who's a diagnostics company at a pitch day and actually I thought their business model was wrong at the time so I didn't invest in that initial funding round that they did and they changed their business model they did a pivot and you know said you know Ola we've done this pivot come and see what we're doing so I listened to the pitch again I loved it and I invested but by that time I'd known them for gosh like two years so I could attest to their character I could attest to their levels of integrity I knew that they stuck at things um, so in terms of um, funding, 
I think, you know, is it, I'm, your original question was, is it necessary to take external funding? I think some people haven't. So if you look at companies like MailChimp, for instance, um, they're red herrings, right? They've never taken external funding or hardly ever taken external funding and they've been able to achieve this massive scale. But I think um, generally it's a lot harder. I mean, a lot of, there's, there's a lot of examples of bootstrapped companies that don't take external funding or hardly take external funding. But at some point you're going to have to go for debt and equity for a lot of companies. Um, and I don't think it's a matter of ambition. I think there's, you know, companies that make far more than me that have never taken even a loan from the bank. But um, I think that, you know, it, it, it's something that you have to be open to. So I think the rules for debt and the rules for equity are, are, are kind of the same. And they're around, you know, having something reliable, having something that, you know, brings in a monthly income and is growing. But also, um, I think even just as important is, is having the relationships. And I, I'm going to finish my answer with a, um, a beautiful quote from um, the Harvard Business Review um, that says, the best time to build your network is before you need it. And the best time to keep that network strong is always. Gotcha. Ah, I love that. Let's talk about establishing credibility, which I think ties into the idea of the network. Uh, Kenneth Church actually has a couple of questions in the Q&A around this and sort of talking about the oil industry and it's sort of, it's a pretty competitive space. I mean, people, the oil and gas services is sort of like the dream space for Nigerians to work in. Um, so how do you establish credibility in that? What kind of challenges did you face in, sort of, in terms of um, sort of setting up in that space? And I also know probably, let me just tag on a question about copycat businesses, because in Nigeria, once you start doing it, there's always somebody who thinks, ah, here's the opportunity, I should jump into it. So if you could talk about establishing credibility and then sort of what competition looks like in that space once you start to do the business. Um, so first of all, in terms of credibility, um, and like I said, there's always an element of luck to these things. I'm bringing my authentic self, right? So Bring it on, bring it on, please. Um, I think that when you have a degree in medicine and surgery, people automatically assume that you're smart. And it's wrong okay. assumption. <laughs> That's the mistake I've been making. That's the mistake I've been making. Got to go back and get a medical degree. <laughs> well, people are automatically, like, there's some kind of, like, you know, charisma or some kind of, like, magical thing that comes with it um, that people think that you must know what you're talking about. Um, and that, that's not always true. I know, you know, people, people associate, you know, medicine with, um, you know, intelligence. Um, but I don't think it's just, I, I don't think it's just um, the course that you take. Um, there's this theory in economics that talks about the signaling role of advanced degrees. So I think that sometimes, you know, taking an extra qualification or taking sort of some sort of um, something that associates you with a particular industry or being part of an industry association um, or being a volunteer um, on um, some, some type of industry um, initiative always helps. So, and those things are pretty easy to do, right? It's not as if the elections are like, um, you know, the ele do election that has just passed. They don't do a die affairs. To be part of an association or to be head of an association, an industry association or to be head of, you know, a voluntary uh, CSR effort, um, a foundation, they're not like that, you know, difficult to do. To be head of a trade association or on the board of a trade association, like a chamber of commerce, again, they're not highly competitive positions, um, but they do bring a lot of credibility. I think also in terms of credibility, when you keep a blog or a vlog um, and you're known in the industry, that also gives um, a lot of credibility. If your father is somebody, then that also gives you a lot of credibility because you can rely on that family name. And I'm not just talking about your dad, but, you know, leverage these things. Because what I've realized there is that, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to rely on this uncle. Or I don't want to, don't, don't worry. If, if you are not the person relying on your uncle, then it's an external person that will rely on your uncle and inherit your uncle. So if you have somebody in your family as well, or within your network or within your church that can put a good word in for you, um, I think that it's, it, it's always wise to leverage on that as well. So I think credibility comes from, you know, being positioned, you know, degrees, first of all, like I said, taking specific qualifications can help, but also being members of certain associations especially if you're on the committee or the board of those associations, that can also help foundations, I think, can help you build credibility. What you read, what, um, what you write and what you produce um, can also help with the credibility. And searching somewhere in your network for that influential uncle or auntie or sister or brother, if you come from that kind of family, 
um, and can also be a useful credibility indicator because I think it signals, you know, Nigeria is all about, you know, yeah, it's sometimes I, I, my, my maiden name was Orekunri and it sounded a lot like Olakunri. Okay. Um, and apparently Olakunri was like a very famous accountant. I think one of the first female accountants in Nigeria. So sometimes okay. I'd walk into the office and they'll say, Oh, you're yeah, related to that Olakunri lady. I love her. You know, I'm going to do this for you simply because my name actually sounded like somebody famous or somebody influential. So I didn't have that person in my family, but I just had something that sounded like it could be associated. <laughs> um, so if you do have those people in your network, um, then they can be good sources of reference for you. And I can't tell you about um, some of the difficult rooms I had to get into. And I mean, I'm not related to Captain Kididare in any way. I'm not related to Dr. Lekhe Piton in any way. I just asked them to be on my board. But the power of a letter from them um, really opened doors and um, gave me a lot of credibility where I wouldn't have had it. Um, in terms of copycat businesses, um, there are a lot of copycat businesses. But, and I, I've experienced that. I mean, even the government at one stage started competing with me. So it's been like, it's, it's been a really, really um, tough ride in some cases. But that said, I think that, you know, we've, be, we've been able to be really re resilient. Um, it's a very well diversified company. So from the air ambulance, I mean, our first major contract wasn't even an air ambulance con uh, contract. It was a contract to operate a clinic on behalf of um, an oil company. Um, and um, so we've been always very, very diversified from clinic operations to um, medical supplies, um, to our retainer business, to um, our um, assistance business, to the air ambulance business. So even when the copycats came, they couldn't copy the entire um, spectrum of activities that we're in and they couldn't get the margins. Yeah. Okay. That's... It's good to know. So let me ask, I mean, a related question to that in terms of them being able to get the margins versus you is, this is kind of an operational heavy business. And I know like, so, you know, flights, anything medical requires sort of pretty high discipline. What have been the big challenges in that space? And I mean, I know, yeah, what have been the challenges, what have been your experiences in terms of maintaining sort of a business with sort of such high operational requirements um, in this environment? I think we're at, in Nigeria, we're at a stage of development where we have a massive infrastructure gap. So okay. even in yeah. India, like um, there's a hotels company, um, uh, online hotels, but they actually ended up, you know, building their own hotels, right? So you find increasingly one of the trends in developed, um, uh, developing countries is for um, companies to start with a very sort of offline model, but eventually having to build some infrastructure along the way. Um, and I mean, even Amazon has started, you know, it bought Whole Foods, which gave the physical infrastructure, and they've started opening up physical stores. And if you look at a lot of the online um, banking, um, then they have like these you know, um, like Paga, for instance, which is um, a mobile money platform, they do have their agency uh, banking centers um, yeah. around yeah. That provide them with um, physical infrastructure to um, for, for people to transact. So in areas where there's no um, ATM, for instance, like you see these, you know, Paga places, right? So I go and withdraw money and that, that's almost like a piece of physical infrastructure. And they have these kiosks as well that you can go to for agency banking. Um, so I think that in developing countries especially, people tend to um, have to somehow um, perhaps get into some kind of ownership um, and that makes it a lot heavier than the more asset light models that we see abroad. And those come with their own challenges, but they also come with, with, with benefits as well. Because I think that when you, when you own the heavy assets, then it's more difficult to compete. I'll give you an example. One of like our, because I don't believe that tech is just internet. I believe that tech is innovative thinking. I believe that um, you can, and tech is um, what you can build. I, I believe that tech is, um, you know, if, if I make a medical um, device, for instance, that's tech. Um, and yeah. I think, that, you know, um, one of the most innovative things that we did is we wanted to reach, you know, we'd sort of saturated the, top end market and we wanted to go down a rung. So we came up with um, an idea with Eric to start yeah. putting, you know, a commercial cabin um, yeah. in the back of their aircraft, normal, uh, normal, commercial, uh, normal commercial aircraft. Yeah. 
So we had those sort of cabins at the back and that gave us a real competitive advantage, right? Because it brought the cost of um, a transfer from Lagos Port Harcourt down from uh, $25,000 thereabouts to like $1,000 or $2,000, right? So it was like a, a 10, 10%, less than 10% of what it was. And that gave us access to a new market. But because we owned that infrastructure, got that specially designed for us, but, you know, but, you know, trying to design something specifically for Arik Air and all those conversations um, around the design and around the infrastructure and around the IP and bringing it um, um, to Nigeria meant, you know, that we, we had a competitive advantage with that product. Um, so um, I think that, and a lot of the things that um, sort of the components were custom made, we had to like sort of figure it out along the way. Um, so because of that, I think that that gave us um, a, a form of advantage. So I think, you know, asset light business models are great. Um, yeah. Don't be afraid to invest in infrastructure where you, where you need to, if that is in line with your strategy. We did a session with um, a lawyer named uh, Victor Baster a few weeks ago. And it's actually one of the things that he talked about was this idea that in markets like ours, that built infrastructure that companies often have to put in place early in their operations, A, raises the cost of the business because you're spending so much on capital expenditure, but then becomes sort of a really difficult to surmount business advantage over time because it just establishes you in a way that it's, it takes way too much investment for sort of your competitors to sort of catch up with you. So I think that is an interesting idea. And it's interesting to hear you actually say that's played out in your business. I think that's really good. I'd like to get into sort of, for you, what are the, what, what are the key elements of success? You know, sort of what, what is it that makes a business succeed in this environment? What are, say, three things that are just absolutely critical? And what's different here versus building a business anywhere else in the world? Um, so I say that here, there are two sets of forces that act on your business. They're the market forces and they're evil forces. And both sets of forces need to be managed. Where I think, um, as in many developed countries, in many advanced um, countries, you only really have to deal with the market forces. But here, I think you also need to deal with the evil forces. And what I mean by evil forces okay. are the, the, the policy issues and the the um, sort of the uh, mostly around um, policy, mostly around um, the way the infrastructure gaps, mostly around the things that can kill your business that aren't due to the market. So I can remember reading Jimovia's book, and one of the funniest things was he said that one of the biggest problems with his first branch was that people couldn't get there, like the road was bad, so um, you know people couldn't actually get to the bank, so he had to build the road. And that Adjosa Adeogu Road, you know, it's any bank that has been maintaining the road ever since. And that was a primary problem. It wasn't the bank. The bank was fine. But uh, people, people just could not drive in. Um, so I think that, you know, these are some of the evil forces, I guess, that you have to um, take into consideration and be, be able to... Um, be able to manage. And I think that um, there's, a, there's a really nice Harvard Business Review article. It's from a couple of years ago. I don't know if um, the audience will be able to find it. It's called Getting to Da. Um, and it's, I cited it in one of Getting my... To? Getting to Da. Okay. Yes, but in, I think, maybe in, I, I don't know what language, it, what language it's in, but it was talking about getting to yes but in you know, emerging markets. And one of the things that it said is it highlighted the role of uh, relationships and it highlighted the role of non-market strategy. And what I mean by non-market strategy is kind of dealing with the evil forces, the political um, and the uh, policy issues that can act on your business and, and realizing, that, no, it, sorry, somebody's asking if it's dark. No, it's DA, get into that. DA. So that means yes in somebody's language. I can't remember. Um, it was a long time ago I, I read the article, but I, I thought it was very, very powerful because it was highlighting the difference between a very famous book um, from Harvard called Getting to Yes and Getting to Da in a more developed... Ah, you see, my audience are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the word is that it's in Russian. <laughs> so like, uh, do you business in emerging getting to yes? But in emerging markets, and you know, they highlighted the role of evil forces. And yeah, there are evil forces in Russia as well. In any emerging market, you find um, more of these evil forces, more of these 
um, political um, and policy issues and um, more of a need to develop relationships in, in those areas as well. There's, there's also a lot of trust issues and because it's more difficult, I guess, somebody has already posted the link to the article. This audience, eh? You guys are too good. <laughs> as soon as I say something, they're on the internet, they've got the article, they've got the course. Amazing. Two people have already posted the article. Love it. Love it. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, the so th these kind of issues and being very aware of them and then not um, not ignoring them, I think it, um, it, it is a key issue. As well as really looking at the market in front of you, and I wrote quite a popular article um, called the "Mystery of Market Size" on my Medium. And one of the things that I said there was, you know, really try and look at the people in front of you that you want to serve, and try not to imagine. Um, that their lives are like you would want them to be. So, I mean, when I first read the article, people were like, you know, how can you be comparing us to India? You know, India is so poor. And, you know, how can you say that India has more, uh, more poor people than Nigeria? That look at them, that those are the people that were coming to, teach, <laughs> uh, that coming to teach and begging for jobs in Nigeria. But, you know, things have changed. And, and, and unfortunately, some countries um, have developed a lot faster than us. And now only 5% of the Indian population actually live in extreme poverty compared to 60% um, of the Nigerian population. There are only about 2 million households that earn $9,000 and above compared to 100 million households in India. So even not comparing to the UK, not comparing to America, not comparing to you know, an advanced country, but even comparing to a country where you know, most people would think we're kind of on the same level, we're actually not. And that's yeah. why it's so important to innovate and build businesses for the people right in front of you and the people that, you know, the customers that are sort of highlighted by the data. And it's who they are, not who you'd like them to be. So I got a pitch about, you know, somebody comparing a business in New York and saying this has worked in New York, um, so it should, it should work in Nigeria. And I said, you know, <laughs> but New York, one in every eight per people is a dollar millionaire. In Nigeria, it's a bit closer to one in 30,000. So, you know, these, some of these high-end um, business models don't necessarily work or may need to be tweaked. Just like I said about, you know, I mean, nobody would think about transferring somebody in a commercial aircraft in America. I think it's even illegal in America. Gotcha. But in Nigeria, this is a product that is being used every day, right? That's what people can afford because there's other people in the aircraft and there's just a curtain around this compartment. And like in America, it's actually illegal to do that. Like nobody would do that. But in Nigeria, of course, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's the most practical way to transfer somebody around the region um, for our regional transports and, um, and in Nigeria. So um, we, we had to tweak our air ambulance business model and even our investment model in terms of the, the check sizes that we're able to, um, able to write and the kind of businesses that we're also um, able to, what, what, well, that would work or we feel that we can support um, in, in this um, kind of um, environment. Excellent. So it's actually a really good segue because you've just started the conversation about investment. So I'm going to jump onto the investment side of things. So you're a director of Green Tree. Um, I should note for the audience that Big Cabal Media, that's the parent company for Tech Cabal, is actually a Green Tree investee company. So talk to me about, I mean, investing from the Green Tree perspective. We'll come to Flying Doctors Healthcare Investment in a moment, but um, let's start with Green Tree and Talk me through your experience of sort of investing in this market. Um, what's been the good? What's been the bad? Where the challenges are? How do you see building in this market from an investment perspective, as an investor? I think that, you know, being a doctor, but also um, I'm just finishing my master's in finance and economics, has sort of been, you know, having those sort of three areas of expertise has been really useful um, in terms of being able to um, make decisions around technology investing because the the macroeconomic factors in Nigeria, you know, are really, really important when thinking about investing and thinking about building businesses. And this is why I say, you know, market forces and evil forces, because in England, I don't think the average small business person worries about currency fluctuation in England. I'm not sure that the average person that owns a small business worries about the rate of inflation. I don't 
think the average person worries about whether they can get currency to import their goods. Those things are kind of you know, given. Um, but in Nigeria, these are all things that even small business people um, have to worry about, which is, is quite different and definitely um, are on the top of investors' minds. So we do look at things like the team that's important, the idea that's important, um, the um, macroeconomics, so the unit economics of the business and how well they're hedged with regard to currency is important. But like any business, like any sort of transaction, I think the most important thing um, with any transaction, whether it's an investment transaction, whether it's a loan transaction, whether it's an equity transaction, it is, is the character of the person um, and the um, and sort of the, the, the level of integrity that person has. Um, investing in a company is like, um, you know, getting married. Like I told you, I can't count how many WhatsApp messages I send to you all the time. I send to everybody, we're always talking. So you have to make sure that the person, like for us, I think, you know, making sure that the person has a good, a good track record in terms of integrity is really um, important to us. So market fit, yes, team, market size. I'm obsessed with market size, as most people watching would know if you know me. I'm always talking about the size of the market and I love big markets because I think that there's more chance when you're really trying to hack a big market. I think also sustainability, cash flow, how the person manages money, etc. But we're, we're, um, as investors, we're really, really like in the business of integrity, um, most of all. And if you read even the earliest history of banking, I mean, these banking articles were being written in the 1920s and the 1930s by people like Bagay Hart, for instance. They, they say, like there's this quote by, um, I, it's, I think it's one of the earliest writers in banking, and I think he was writing in the 1930s. And he says that when you want to loan somebody money, and bearing in mind that this was, you know, in 1920, he said that when you want to loan somebody money, I'm just trying to find the name of the, it, was, it was Schumpeter, and it was in 1939. He said the banker must not only know what transaction he is asked to finance and how likely it is to turn out, but he must also know the customer, his business, and his private habits. Um, and get by by frequently talking things over to him to get a clearer sense of the situation. So even like the earliest bankers that were like forming the financial industries that weren't running as, um, you know, financing um, institutions that we know today, we're still talking about personal habits, right? Get talking with the person, get to know the person. Um, and I think that that's, this has always been important for Green Tree, as well as all of the, the other factors that make up the business. Um, okay. So I'll say, I mean, I think I get this in terms of, of the principles and the theories that back it. But I'd, I'd love to get like your actual experiences, you know, like has your portfolio largely been successful? Has it largely been up and down, rocky? Have you guys made, you know, 50X returns on everything that you've invested in? Um, how does it, you know, what is the reality of early stage investing from your perspective? You know, just from your, yeah, the way it's been for you. I think the um, the, reality of early stage investing right now is across Africa, most funds fail. Most funds don't make any money. So when people come to me and they're like, oh, I really want to be an angel investor. I'm like, how much do you actually have to play with? Because I don't want you risking your life savings in something that can return zero. Like literally you can lose all your money. And I we have actually done well at Green Tree, we've managed to make a good return um, for our investors and we're tracking very well in terms of, you know, one of the better performing funds in, um, in, um, in Africa. But I don't think it's all down to skill. I think it's down to relationships as well. I think it's down to the people that we invested in. But I, I, I do think that there's an element of luck because I know some really good people that I don't think are more intelligent than that have lost all of their investors' money. So I think that, you know, it's hard. Africa is hard. And being an investor in Africa, coping with these devaluations, coping with some of the evil forces, um, is really difficult. So if you do want to get into angel investing, um, I think be prepared, mindset or be prepared to lose it all. Because I can sit down in my house and invest in, you know, one of the bank euro bonds or one of the corporate euro bonds. And those bonds are returning like 8% with no efforts. Zero. No calls, no monitoring, no board meetings, no nothing. Um, and you can make, you know, $500,000, $1 million per quarter or nothing. 
you're not investing, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting in your house and the money is just, the, the, the banker just calls you that you just made money and the coupon, you know, this is your coupon and that's it. So, yeah. um, I think, you Although know. you do have to balance that again against inflation risk or. Inflation, I say euro bonds. Yeah, so euro bonds. Euro bonds is in dollar. Yeah. So like, okay. so like the, that, that is the reality. And still, I would say that most of my portfolio is in less exotic investments, um, and then some of it is in startups. But I think the the, the beauty with um, startups is that you're you're, you're part of something, um, yeah. and I think um, that sometimes the, the, there's there's a buzz that comes with that. There's a buzz with helping businesses work together and helping them scale and bringing your ideas to the table. And also there is that possibility of making these um, ultra high returns. And we have, you know, made very, very good returns um, in some of our, um, some of our portfolio. So I think what's the reality of being an investor in Nigeria? I think the reality is that you can lose all your money. There's a degree of skill. Yeah. A degree of relationship. Um, there's a degree of being able to pick up the phone and manage some of the evil forces on behalf of your portfolio companies. And if you don't have that kind of Rolodex, it's not something that you want to go into at all because there are many evil forces that need to be managed. And I think also um, that there are massive, massive opportunities, but I think that it's something that needs to be studied. It's not something that you just go into and it's not something that you use your only money in the world to do. I think that if you're, you know, we talk about a risk averse and risk neutral investors. Um, I think that if you're a, a risk averse investor, then it's definitely not something to go into. If you're more risk neutral, um, then maybe you can roll the dice, but definitely don't use the money that you need to pay your child's school fees or you need to like eat to do it. That's the reality. Um, I think uh, a, a honest, an honest picture of being an investor in Nigeria. But like I said, we've done very well as Green Tree. Um, we're tracking at similar, we're tracking at similar returns with the with the um, Flying Doctors Healthcare Investment Fund as well. But you have to remember, this is all I do, right? I don't really do anything else. I have no kids, I have no commitments, I have no, you know, this is like literally all I do from morning to night. And I think that, you know, it also depends on your lifestyle as well and what you want to achieve. Like it's, it's, it's super hard work. It requires a lot of focus and it's, you know, it, it, it's very, very, very intense um, sort of work in terms of really helping you. It requires a lot of bandwidth. Um, and I think that maybe if you don't have the bandwidth, it's maybe better to keep, um, you know, um, in, into passive investments. Gotcha. Um, so let's talk about Flying Doctors, sort of a healthcare investment company. You recently announced, you know, sort of that you are looking to raise a billion dollars. I see that you're previously invested in Life Stores, Kuniku, MDAS, um, Helium Health, uh, Chisco Express. Um, so talk to us a little bit about this sort of the new fund and sort of what what the thesis is for this uh, sort of investment company. So um, healthcare has always been my true love. Um, and I've, you know, um, over the years, I, I've just realized that uh, unless, you know, we we really put more behind it, we're not going to be able to move the, health, um, the needle in healthcare in Africa. Africa is has overwhelmingly the worst healthcare statistics in the world, the highest number of women that die during pregnancy and childbirth, the highest number of children um, that die under the age of five years old. In fact, more children die under the um, age of five years old here in Nigeria than in anywhere else on earth. So we're doing catastrophically in terms of um, the number of children um, that die. In terms of the doctor-patient ratios, again, we don't have the talent. In terms of the number of beds for hospitals, again, and there's problems. In terms of the number of people that die from um, road traffic accidents, again, um, there are issues there, highest in the world um, in Africa. So we have overwhelmingly the poorest healthcare in the world. Um, and what COVID has taught us, if it's taught us anything at all, I think the biggest lesson is that a healthcare problem anywhere can very quickly become a healthcare problem everywhere. Um, and poor healthcare infrastructure in one tiny city or town um, can very quickly become a global disaster. Nobody had heard of Wuhan this time last year, but a problem in Wuhan um, became a problem um, for the world very quickly. So I think investing in infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, now makes sense for global investors, especially in areas where there's weak healthcare infrastructure. 
um, I think that China actually did quite well and responded with a lot of money and a lot of force. And I think that if that type of problem had happened in Africa, where the healthcare um, infrastructure is weaker and it hadn't been detected or managed as quickly, then it may have been more of a disaster for the world than um, what has happened with um, COVID. So I think that that's the first thing. The second thing is that if you look at the top 10 um, companies by revenue in America, three of them are actually healthcare companies. So healthcare is actually great business. It contributes to the economy, it contributes to the GDP. Um, and I think that there's a good revenue argument for investing in healthcare. And thirdly, the NHS in the UK is actually the second biggest employer in the world. If you look okay. at every state in America, you see that the biggest employers are in healthcare. The top two to three employers are in healthcare. Um, so healthcare also, one of the biggest problems in Africa is unemployment. And if you can get people into work, then um, it prevents two problems for Europe. Number one, it prevents the security issues because I think that a lot of the issues around terrorism, a lot of the um, um, issues around violence actually have their roots in, in disenfranchisement and unemployment. And I think the second big issue is, you know, this issue of migration. Um, people, you know, um, trekking through the Sahara Desert and desperately trying to be anywhere but Africa because they don't have jobs and they don't have opportunities. And I think investing in healthcare infrastructure, investing in this massive employer and massive generator of economic returns um, is a great investment for anybody in the world to want to do um, simply because of the benefits that it brings to not just Africa, um, but all of the countries around it too. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask the audience, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, we're definitely already in the Q&A section, so I'm going to get uh, start going through these. We actually do need to stop at about 12.20, so let's get into some of these questions. So, Polake Owoduni wants to know what three things new startup founders can do daily, weekly, to really understand market and evil forces that affect their business. I think you're going to be hearing a lot about the evil forces after this. <laughs> but yes. So what are three things new startup founders can do to really understand market and evil forces that affect their business? Okay, um, so there's a few really great resources that I can point you to. Um, I'm sure, you know, the, the Google crew um, on the Q&A will already find the resources. Um, but there's um, two very, um, there's a, I think that there's a good Harvard Business Review on non-market strategy. Uh, no, MIT, it's from MIT. So if you type in um, MIT and non-market strategy, um, you can get a really good um, article from there. It's a, a fantastic resource. I've posted it on Twitter um, before about dealing with non-market strategy and some issues um, to do with non-market strategy. Um, and then there's a course, I think at Chicago Booth, um, I might be wrong, but on non-market strategy as well. Um, I don't know if they've put it online or not, but I think that there's there's a course at one of these um, American business schools on non-market strategy. So those are longer resources than I can sort of answer in the few minutes that I have. But um, generally, um, dealing with evil forces as a small business or a startup, um, number one, again, I'll go back to associations. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a reason why in Nigeria there's an association for everything. There's an association for grave diggers. There's an association for wives. <laughs> an association for wives of former governors. Uh, there's a there's an association for everything, and I think the reason why all of these associations are formed uh, to sort of give a voice to the industry that you're in. So I think joining some of these associations and being able to explain um, why your business needs certain and using the, your position in those industries, especially if you're on the board, and um, sorry, associations, especially if you're on the board or the committee, don't isolate yourself from your industry. And some yeah. of the people in those associations you may feel, I mean, because like a lot of tech people are like quite sophisticated and they understand coding and they understand the internet. And some of these, um, you know, people in the industry associations, you might consider, you know, not to be your contemporaries um, because they operate offline businesses, maybe they're uneducated. Um, but I think that, you know, being able to take um, sort of an apex um, sort of role in your industry association um, also helps you manage non-market forces or at least you get some forewarning or you have a platform to be, yeah. able, to, um, to, to be able to put things forward that affect your industry. And gotcha. as soon as a Nigerian politician hears the word association. Gotcha. <laughs> association in the world, as far as it's a courtesy visit from an association, you get audience. Gotcha. If you're on your yeah. own, you might not. Interesting, interesting. There's a quite interesting question here from Joe Ifena. He wants to know how we can help the next generation of Africa's healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, lab scientists, start conceiving opportunities beyond traditional practice. I think that's a good question for you, actually. 
Yeah. yeah, it is because it's one of the things that I really, really, really grappled with. So it's 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 a really you know sensitive thing for me because um, it took um, a long time to for me to realize that being good at what you do is not necessarily being good at the business of what you do. So what you do and what I was doing at the time was, you know, even when I, when I started um, my business, for the first few years, I was only going to emergency medicine conferences. You'd see me okay. flying down, but I was going to, you know, the latest technology in emergency, in emergency medicine for this, the air ambulance technology, or you can learn how to do heart surgery in an air ambulance. Uh, you know, I, I didn't go to a single business conference because I didn't think that was necessary. But yeah. I learned the hard way that being extraordinarily good and knowledgeable about the science of your business will not save you from the rest of your business. Um, and I've done a complete 360 now because people know me more for finance and um, economics than they even do for medicine. Because I, I, I learned the very hard way that you need to be up to date with your legal. You need to be up to date with marketing and communications, with customer service, with all these non-market strategy things that um, I was talking about. Um, and also with, with, with finance and accounting. Um, so as a medical person, as a healthcare person, everything about your training tells you that you need to be a specialist and that's the goal. And business is a complete polar opposite because everything about business is pushing you in the direction of being a generalist and yeah. understanding a little bit about everything. So when I yeah. speak to lawyers now, I say, you know, they say, oh, this is a contract. They say, no, 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 I don't want the contract like this. I want it like this and I want this to be here. Yeah. And you got to learn to be your own as well, yeah. When people come with, when I go to the bank or when I go to a financer and I want a, a, a type of financing structure, I'll be like, no, 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 no. Actually, I think that this is a NITA structure. I come up with my own structures now. And this is how we're going to pay it. This is how we're going to pay back. This is how we're going to end. This is what the collateral is going to be. Because I know a little bit about that as well. So it's about knowing just enough to yeah. be able to contribute meaningfully to every conversation. When I'm speaking to my uh, communications and marketing uh, people, teams, they're like, oh, you know, how do you know about this? You didn't study it, but I don't, I don't know enough. I don't know, I'm not an expert like you, but I know a little bit to know what I want. Yeah. So um, I think as, um, as, as scientists and as academics, we're pushed in the completely wrong direction for business um, with none of the skills that you need to run a practical business. At least in law, they teach you a bit about negotiation. They teach you about communication. They teach you about how to present a case. Whereas in medicine, we're not even taught any practical skills. So you leave medical school or you leave studying um, biochemistry or lab science or uh, nursing with absolutely no real life skills. Um, and uh, the aim well, of being- saving people's lives is a real life skill. But. <laughs> <laughs> the skills that it, I mean, by life skills, I mean, not necessarily- um, Yeah, no, but I get what you mean. I do get what you mean. I do. But for, for what you need to apply <laughs> to your general life, um, yeah. And um, I, I, I think that it's important that you try and educate yourself. Number one, um, because as um, a doctor, your course is longer. Actually, you know, you're still you're in school for three years. Most people leave after three years. So you're, you end up being friends with only doctors or nurses or lab scientists or whatever. So expanding your friendship group and that experience that I related in Japan, it really helped me. And secondly, going out to seek the knowledge. So now you cannot catch me at an emergency medicine conference. Um, you know, I decided to, you know, completely, you know, take accounting courses, take communications courses, um, take investment courses. And now that, you know, um, I'm doing investing full time. Um, so um, I'm just um, on, on the board of flying doctors of the air ambulance company. Now I'm like, you know, just about finishing my master's in finance and economics, while most of my mates are doing master's in orthopedics or cardiology. Um, so I think being able to sort of expand our friendship groups so we have different types of conversations but also to um actively seek out those not that knowledge um through you know taking short yeah. courses or taking longer courses is really important fair enough so i was asking how you manage the masters with all you do but i do know you spoke earlier about not doing much else beyond working and studying <laughs> 
Yeah, so I, I'm I'm super boring. Like I I just don't do much outside um, work, and I I really really believe in focus. So um, for me, I've realised you know I think it's being a, um, self aware. I know people that can do like twenty different things at a time and do them all fantastically well. Um, I realised that I'm really not that person. So I literally do maybe one or two things at a time. And, and, and try to do them to the best of my capacity. So, um, you know, other areas, I, I think that, you know, one of the beautiful things about economics is economics is truthful. Your mom, your brother, your sister, your pastor may, may be able to tell you that you can do everything. Don't worry, eh? you, you know, motivational speakers, maybe not a pastor, pastors tend to be truthful, but motivational speakers will tell you, you just have to believe it, <laughs> see it, and you can do everything. Economics um, is called the dismal science because yeah. it tells you that you have to make trade-offs. So real constraints. Yeah, it, it tells you that jump. if you do one thing, you might not be able to do the other. And obviously, I've tried to focus on one or two things. Okay. okay. I've got a really great operational question for you, which is from Mulua Tobi Balogun, which is, how do you break even with companies paying even later than the time limits agreed in your SLAs? Um, it's really difficult to get business to continue when funds needed to, don't come in. And that's a big problem in Nigeria. I know a lot of sort of like um, uh, people experience. How, what's, what's your experience of that? How do, you, how do you manage that? With a military approach. Okay. Tell us. So, Practical. So, like what should Toby do tomorrow? <laughs> no, you need a military approach for that because they are fond of that and they'll kill your business. So yeah. first of all, I think you need a strategy to make friends and influence people. So I think the, one of the most important people that you can be friends with is the financial controller or okay. the accountant. You need to make friends with that person and make sure that your invoice is the first on his list to be paid. So okay. develop a relationship with all of the financial controllers that are in your company. And then your accountant, that accounts receivable should be the first thing he does in the morning and the last thing he faces at night. So being able to develop the relationship is one thing. Being able to keep that relationship is another thing. So making sure that as soon as the invoice is due, he sends the first invoice due notice. Please, we need payment. The next day, and let, let, that, let, let that reminder have a number 34 days late, 35 days late, 36 days late. If it means that you have to deploy your accountant to go and sit there every morning, it's, it's, yeah. it's acceptable. So if you need to send a team physically there, maybe two people physically there to go and sit down, sir, please. Hmm. I've never done that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I matter. Sometimes you need, you need somebody to be sitting there every day. And if this is the kind of money that is closing down your business, it's worth the investment. Pay for somebody to go yeah. and resume in the person's office at 9 a.m. and just be sitting yeah. there looking. Sir, please. Not, not uh, intimidating. Or, Sir, please. You know, we're a small business. Sir, please. That's our invoice. Let the person go there and be resuming there every day. Your invoice will get paid, but your relationship with the financial controller is very important because he has a pile of invoices and he has discretion over which one he's going to treat I'm first. Just, so make yeah. sure that your own is the one that he treats first. Gotcha. So as to know, again, operational, um, how are you finding people? I, everyone says there's no talent out there. How do you find and train Nigerians and maintain a culture of excellence operationally? Do you know, I think I have an article for everything. So the longer okay. answer is actually in um, my article, Where Are the Nigerian Executives? Where I write about the reason why it's, it's so, some of the reasons why I think it's so difficult to find executives. Um, and, um, you know, even when you find it's, it's a bit, of, the talent is, you know, pricier than what you would find in India. Um, and there are a whole load of reasons I analyze um, in that article um, that I won't go into here because of time. But I think, you know, I think you have to hire for um, attitude rather than aptitude. So hire for um, the people that hire the people that you know show a willingness to learn and show a good attitude rather than what it says on their CV. My best hires have not actually come from like the Nigerian Ivy League universities. So people talk about Covenant, people talk about Unilag, people talk about UI, talk, people talk about um, OAU. Um, and those are like the Ivy League universities that everybody likes to hire from. But some of my best hires have come from the more poly, poly universities. Some of them have had HNDs um, and they've been just as good, um, if not better. So don't be too carried away by the Nigerian yeah. Ivy League, by what it says on their CV. I think that, you know, hire for attitude and not for um, aptitude. 
and you know HNDs and ONDs with talent are better than BSEs with a bad attitude. Um, and then secondly, I think that you need to put a training program in place that is more solid than you'd see in any, you know, in any company of your size abroad. So your talent development um, infrastructure has to be like rock solid um, in terms of being able to um, do online education, daily presentations. You have to make sure that your organization is a learning organization, acknowledging that there are deficits in the Nigerian education system um, that may not allow people to develop as um, they should have developed. And things like communication, things like reading and writing, things like critical thinking should be integral parts of that um, learning and development program. Um, and there's so many online courses that you can find um, about um, from uh, LinkedIn Learning to Coursera to YouTube. And I think that you as an owner um, should take charge of that process of really making sure that your organization becomes a learning organization and honestly put exams in place as well. Like the things that need to be known. Um, I have an application called classmarker.com competencies that people need to have to do the job and I think that those should be based on examinations so um, you know get your HR or if you don't have a HR and you have a HR be that HR put those exams in place and say for me to move from this level to this level you need to pass this exam for you to be able to like after a week in the job these are the things that you need to know after a month in the job these are the things that you need to know and it can even be on YouTube it doesn't have to be anything posh if last last Go on uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, right? There's a place where you can go, you can record yourself. Record yourself, upload that thing to Google Drive. You have your course that people need to take. You have your courses about your business, your own, whether you're selling, even if it's like Puff Puff, make your own Puff Puff University on, um, on PowerPoint and make sure that everybody um, is trained up accordingly. Gotcha. Okay, I've got a couple more questions I really do want to get into before you leave. Jade Sola De Deji, hello. Uh, STEM Mets wants to know, don't you think we need to circle back into serious foundational issues in the educational system to address the skills gap, the unemployment in the country? So that, that does speak a little bit to some of what we're talking about. We do, we do. Um, there are serious issues. We can't deny that there are serious issues um, with, the, with the education system. Um, and there are foundational issues that are, are difficult to have. Um, but there are also Nigerians moving to Canada every single year. There are also Nigerian doctors and nurses moving to the UK and starting immediately in the UK every day. So that means that we do have talent, um, but that talent needs to be developed and um, through like the kind of serious like HR boot camp approach that small to medium-sized businesses abroad don't necessarily need to put in place. But in Nigeria, it's in order to compensate um, for that education, um, uh, education deficit, we definitely need to put those things in place. Gotcha. A question from Tony O here. You mentioned the link between national development welfare and the healthcare system. Uh, national development welfare and the healthcare system. Um, now, full clarity on this lies in data and information availability that we just don't have in Nigeria. Um, so do you have thoughts about how we start to improve sort of that availability of data among the systems? I mean, you're investing um, in this sector. So do you have a sense, um, are there things being done? Are there things that we should be doing in terms of collating information on these separate things and making them accessible to decision makers, to operators, et cetera? So I think that data is available in Nigeria. It's just very scattered and it's not accessible. So, and it's not digestible. So I think that you can get bits and pieces of data, um, but it's not put together in a way that people can read. So I'll go back to my blog on um, mystery of market size. It's been read like half a million times. And yeah. Yeah. It was all stuff that was out there, yeah. primary research. I just sat down and just put some of the things that were already out there together, maybe put it into graphs a bit, put it into a few diagrams, but this was all stuff that we know. So I think that um, a lot of the data in Nigeria is just scattered in one NGO, in one funny bank, in, and nobody really brings that data together in a digestible um, form. Um, and I think that that's really the Nigerian data problem. I think that, you know, 
I, I draw graphs, like I, I have a bit of a passion for data visualization. So I draw a lot of graphs. Um, I put like out a lot of statistics, um, but I never do any primary research. And sometimes I put out a statistic that I got off the internet or got off the Nigerian um, Variable Statistics website. And people are like, oh, wow, you know, Dr. Ola, that statistic that you put out is really controversial. I'm like, this is, for, this is from five years ago. It's nothing controversial. It's been in existence, but it's just not been made accessible and digestible. So I do believe that we could gather more data in Nigeria, but I also believe that it would be great if we could just, you know, bring out that data um, and make it more, um, um, more, access, um, more accessible and more digestible for people as well. Fantastic. I'm going to ask one last question. There are quite a few more, but I do know Dr. Allah has to go. Um, and this one, sorry, everybody who accuses me of bias, is from Dimo Alatikomo. And he wants to know, you've built so much expertise, experience, and goodwill with uh, great energy and a belief in Nigeria. Knowing that we lack so much human capital in governance, are you considering going into governance in the future to, to help fight the evil forces, amongst other things? <laughs> um, you know, the reason why I probably wouldn't go into government is because I believe in the private sector and I believe that if you really want to make change and if you really want to make impact, you can make far more impact in the private sector um, than may be possible um, in the public sector. And I think, you know, the, the kind of, um, I guess anybody that knows me knows, like I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with Aliko Dangote. I'm sure I've mentioned him in this interview. We yeah, have noticed. <laughs> 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 Like he's sort of my biggest role model because I think that he's probably one of the most impactful people in Nigeria and he's done that through, he's never held a government position. He's made his impacts as the second biggest employer after government, as the largest um, sort of um, receiver of foreign direct investment, um, as the, one of the largest philanthropic foundations in Africa. He's made all of that impact. And through the power of the private sector. And I'm a big believer in the power of the private sector and the, uh, the power of business as a force for good. I don't have the time to, to, we don't have the time to really get into this, but I uh, so disagree with you on this. I don't think we make any progress if we don't fix governments. I don't think Aliko, for all his success, um, is a drop in the bucket of the development that we need. But that's a conversation that unfortunately we have to have another day. <laughs> I have 16 more questions for you, but I do know you said you had a hard to stop right now. I do, I do. Um, so I apologize, people. I've tried to prioritize the questions that haven't already been addressed in some way, shape, or form. So hopefully for those of you whose questions I haven't specifically asked, she has already spoken to them in some form or the other. Um, I'd like to say a very, very big thank you. For thank you so much. Well. <laughs> um, I think it's been a fascinating session. Um, lots to learn. Lots of um, reading for people to go back and do. Um, I like your dropping the articles and the courses that they should be doing. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the UK Tech Hub for pulling this together. Uh, the UK Nigeria Tech Hub for uh, supporting and making this possible. Um, thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us. There will be a recording of this, uh, which we will put out once it's done. Um, we'll also do a wrap-up article. If you learned anything, please tweet about it. And please join us because there are three more sessions in this series. So we will have you. Uh, uh, we would love to have you for those sessions. But thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.